Hey everybody, welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. I'm Christy Brower, here with my sister, co-host, and partner in crime, Katie Weaver. Hey Katie. Hello. How's it going? Oh, it's going well. It's, uh, you know, the, the snow's melting, it's nice outside. Uh, oh my gosh. Right? The pigs are now coming in with muddy hooves constantly, oh, and we just, we're fine because they get to go outside, so we're all going to roll with it. How many of you guys have ever had muddy hooves in your house? Probably not. Very I, few. Says me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. That's really funny. No. Well, and I spent the weekend in Boise with my kids, and so our little sow has been desperate to sit in my lap. Yeah. That's, she's hard to hold. Scott holds her all the time, but she's just, she's a lot for me. <clears throat> She's last a big night, kid, man. <laughs> yeah. Last night I was talking to a client on the phone and she is just bellering at me trying to get on my lap. And I'm <laughs> kind of like, no, knock it off. Finally, I had to say to her, no, you can't sit with me right now. Go lay down. And my clients, I'm sure she was wondering if I was wrestling a freaking bear. I had to say, <laughs> I'm really sorry. My little thing just really wants held. And she really laughed. But yeah, it's just, you know, it's an experience talking to me because... <laughs> Who, who the hell knows what's going to happen? <laughs> well, no one. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I am loving the spring weather as well, but I, I had the funniest experience today because the squirrels are like out in full force now. And we have, I live in a neighborhood with a lot of squirrels and my little dog Zizi absolutely goes, I don't know. She turns inside out over mm -hmm. squirrels. And she started barking at the front window and like digging at the glass and absolutely freaking out. And there was a squirrel sitting in the front lawn. And if squirrels could flip the bird, that squirrel was flipping her the bird. And he <laughs> sat there. I swear to you, he sat there at least 60 seconds just staring her down like, yeah, give it your best shot. And both of my dogs were absolutely losing their goddamn minds. And I'll tell you something. This is what <laughs> summer is like at my house. But that squirrel oh, was yeah. so funny. He was making eye contact with her. Like, not only mm -hmm. was he sitting there, he was making sure she knew he was in her front mm -hmm. lawn yard and there was nothing she could do about it. I mm -hmm. Once I finally could, you know, hear myself think, I thought it was so funny. It was Squirrels making are so dang it. naughty. <laughs> Oh, years ago, I saw a squirrel up in our apple trees bombing our with apples. Oh, yes. Yeah. You remember that? Absolutely. Not I do. Throwing them, so but funny. not knocking them off, pitching them down and hitting our bassets on the head that were baying at the squirrels. And they had every bit of it coming because you know what? Leave the squirrels alone, for God's right. sake. Yeah. Right. Oh, Too my funny. gosh. Our squirrels tease Zizi so bad. They run down our big elm tree in the backyard and get really low till she comes flying at them, you know, just freaking out. And then they just run up the tree and sit up at yeah. a high branch and look at her like, yeah, nina, nina. Yeah. And I'm laughing, like, wow. For sure. Yes, laughing. I can really tell that, you know, spring weather is here because the squirrels yep. are making fun of my dog. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how you tell here. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Squirrels in full force. Yep, yep. Got it. It definitely <laughs> is how you tell. Well, what we're bringing to you today is our uh, is our shared case. And you may have noticed that there was a Netflix documentary that came out last week called Murder Among the Mormons. And, you know, we're ex-Mormons. We live in Mormon land. We cannot stop ourselves from talking about one of these kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. So we want to talk to you a little bit about Mark Hoffman today and tell you the story, kind of tell you what it was like growing up Mormon kids in the 80s, which um, watching that uh, documentary, I had a pretty good laugh a few times and just talk oh, a little yeah. bit about, you know, that if you haven't watched it, please watch it. It's quite well done, except I think it went a little soft on the Mormon church, I'm going to say, but um, oh, yeah. their involvement in it. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. So who is Mark Hoffman? Well, Mark Hoffman is actually one of the best document forgers in the world. Yeah. You know, he's now in prison for life. And so he's not forging any other documents. But even now is still acknowledged to be one of the best document forgers in the world. He has, he fooled the FBI. Did you know oh, that? Yeah. 
Fooled the FBI. Crazy. Oh, he started Plus lots pulling of the others. treasury when he was a teenager. He did, yeah. Yeah. Forging stamps on certain coins and stuff. Mm -hmm. He is a very interesting character. So let's talk a little bit about Mark Hoffman. Yeah. So Mark grew up in Salt Lake City and grew up in a very staunch uh, LDS Mormon family. Yeah. Um, you know, he was not a great student, but he did love stamp collecting, coin collecting, and building bombs. Yeah. As a teenager. <laughs> As you do, I guess. Quite the set of um, hobbies there, Mark. Yeah. Quite the set of hobbies and certainly was a foreshadowing of his future life. Mm -hmm. He did serve an LDS mission in 1973. Yeah. And he went to England on that mission. And something you may or may not know is Mormons send their young men and, you know, their unmarriable young women also on missions out into the world to get people to become Mormons. And when the Mormon church was really new, a lot of those missionaries went to England oh, back yeah. in the 1800s. So there's a lot of Mormon history in England, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Until I watched this documentary, I had never thought of it that way. I mean, I knew that was the case, but it never really went, oh, right, of course, so there'd be a lot of stuff there, right? So while he was on his mission, he started collecting uh, Mormon documents and books and stuff like that. Yeah. And some of them were rather critical of the Mormon church and some of them were uh, maybe, you know, alternative stories of what the Mormon church has reported, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so he was saving those things and some of them he was sending home. And it turns out that he really had lost his faith in the LDS church when he was a teenager. But yeah, you have to understand. Computers. He lost his faith when he was 14. Yeah, when he was 14. Yeah. But you have to understand in staunch Mormon families that the pressure to serve a Mormon mission is really strong. Like, mm -hmm. I won't pay for you to go to college unless you go on a mission strong. Oh, yeah. Right? We've all, we've known plenty of boys particularly who've oh, had yeah. that threat and a lot of families really have seen it as a real blight on their family if their sons don't serve missions daughters yes. that that's kind of a, it used to be if a female served a mission it was because she was turning into a bit of an old biddy that's kind of not the case mostly anymore. probably gay don't, but don't, okay <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't come at us for that but you know mm -hmm. that's that's kind of they've made the ages a little bit younger and a lot of girls now just serve because they want to. But back in that day, women didn't really serve missions unless they were kind of running out of prospects for marriage. Yes. And, you know, but yeah, for, so, but for boys, ooh, even now in strong LDS communities, if the boys don't go on a mission, that is. Yeah, you're, you're basically, you know, saying that you're going to live at a, a lower level of life throughout life if you don't serve a mission. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal. Yeah. So Very Mark Hoffman said, you know, he didn't want to disappoint his parents and there was all this social pressure. So he went on this mission. Mm -hmm. But while he was there, he got all interested in this LDS church history, which I think is so interesting because it's all such foreshadowing mm -hmm. for what was to come. Yeah. So he did get married to Dory Olds Hoffman in 1979. And I don't want to speak ill of Dory, but I do want to say that she is one of the least observant wives I have ever seen, ever, ever. <laughs> Except that it doesn't surprise me. Okay, so Dory yeah. raised the children, took care of the house. And the whole time that she was doing that, Mark had a special room in their house mm -hmm. that he kept locked that she was not allowed to go into for their entire marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, if my wife did that for one day, I would be like, what in the hell is behind that door? She said, well, mm -hmm. it's one less room for me to clean, so I didn't care. So you yeah. know what he was doing in that room? <laughs> he was forging all kinds of documents. Yeah. He had all this he weird equipment. How and... you're fitting it up. He was. Yeah. yeah. Right out of their house. 
So she's an interesting character and we'll get back to her later, but mm -hmm. I was amazed by her, but except that it doesn't surprise me because growing up in as, as a Mormon girl, she reminded me, you know, they're, they're, Mormons have this very blind faith in their priesthood mm -hmm. holders, which is all men, mm -hmm. and in their church, mm -hmm. and in all of the other members of the Mormon church. There's mm -hmm. this overarching blind faith. And I don't know if it's as true now as it was when we were kids, but, right. but then, if someone was, yeah, if someone was LDS, then you believed them no matter what they said or did, because they were, you know, a good brother or sister, which meant that they were 100% honest all the time. Yeah. You're going to see -okay. where this goes awry as we oh, tell this story. But I could really there see that in Dory. With her. Oh, yeah. There was a scene with her on the Netflix documentary where she says, people asked me, didn't you know? How didn't you know? And she just kind of went, I just didn't. Well, you know, and, and there was a, a interesting comment from the cohort whose name is escaping me. I know you, you know who I'm talking about. Shannon. The bow tie. Yes. Shannon. Flynn, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shannon we're going to get to him. Who said about her, he said, she didn't want to know. And I thought there's got to be some truth to that because mm -hmm. they had quite a bit of money coming in for a while. Mm -hmm. She had to have had some thoughts in her head. Right. But I agree with Shannon Flynn. She didn't want to know. Yeah. Just as much as Shannon Flynn didn't want to know, I felt that it was really interesting that he said that because he as well didn't want to know. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Don't you worry. So after going on his mission and coming home and getting married, he started pre-med at Utah State University for a while. And then he found forgery. <laughs> so... <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh, this stuff is so crazy. And you have to understand that Mormons are, well, they're a little like Catholics when it comes to their history and the books and the journals and the documents and the everything about their history. They're pretty um, obsessive about owning all of their historical stuff. Oh, yeah. And definitely Mark Hoffman knew that. Mm -hmm. He fueled that. Yeah. He did fuel it. <laughs> he did for quite a while. He had a lot more influence than I think anybody wants to admit. And he forged a lot more documents than I think we actually know of. But this mm -hmm. is how he first got started with this. So in 1980, he claimed that he found something called the Anthon Transcript. Okay. And the Anthon transcript was a Mormon document. Let me try to explain this, if this makes sense. So it, he says he found it in a 17th century King James Bible. That there was this folded up paper that was sort of stuck inside of this Bible. Mm -hmm. And that the document was a transcript that Joseph Smith, who is the founder and original prophet of the Mormon church, had basically said aloud to his scribe at the time, who was Martin Harris. And then, so it was like this transcript of something that Joseph Smith said that nobody ever found before. It was also written in Egyptian, <laughs> which seemed a little weird, except that there is some Egyptian stuff in the translations of the Book of Mormon. And so for Mormons, this was a huge deal because this was literally something that was transcribed by Joseph Smith to Martin Harris. Might not mean a thing to you, but if you are a Mormon historian or a Mormon higher up, this is a huge, huge find. Yeah. Okay, so he starts... Um, so he gets it authenticated, okay? Yeah. And... He, so he wants to have it proven that it is, in fact, real. And he does. Mm -hmm. And so then the LDS church says that they're going to buy it from him for $20,000. Yeah. Which, okay, this is 1980, you guys. That's a lot of money. I was five, okay? Yeah. 
So they purchase it from him. And he also gets some other um, old church paraphernalia from them. A $5 gold Mormon coin, because for a while they printed their own money. Mormons did. Deseret Bank Notes, a first edition of the Book of Mormon. So he got money, plus he got these other things because mm -hmm. he obsessively collected this kind of stuff himself. Yeah. And so they said this came out to be basically proof of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. This was used that way mm -hmm. once it was authenticated, right? So yeah. now this is when he quits medical school. And decides mm -hmm. to become a forger instead because or an old documents dealer. Yes, okay. <laughs> fine. That's yeah, okay. That's not what he he wasn't calling himself a forger. <laughs> okay, you're right, you're right. <laughs> so then he starts producing these documents that no one has ever seen before and even knew they existed. And this is the point at which I think maybe somebody might have thought something was a little weird because someone would come to him and say, hey, I'm really looking for this document or that document. And he would just magically show up with it. Like mm -hmm. he would just find it. People have been looking for this document for a hundred years and no one found it. And he found mm -hmm. it. Right. That's because he made it in his freaking secret little room. Right. But they so there was him as the Indiana Jones of Mormon paraphernalia, you know. Yes. He they was a were rock star. absolutely starstruck. Yeah. So Shannon Flynn, who was a rare documents dealer in Salt Lake and became a dear friend of his. And I'm going to show a picture of him because, well, we should. Um, talked about, he said, when I got to meet him for the first time, it was like meeting Michael Jordan. He is yeah. a rock star and you know because he's yeah. finding all these documents and where are they yeah. coming from and they're they're all being authenticated you know yeah. nobody went who the hell is this guy and where is he finding all this shit because he was yeah. a good mormon brother you guys this mm -hmm. is an important part of this you have to understand how important this is in this society that we grew up in that if you are in yeah you're in 100 percent. yeah the rest of the world pretty hinky but if yep. you're in then yeah and that's i think why this got so big so yep. he deceived members of the first presidency of the of the mormon church so at the time um, particularly gordon b hinckley who would later be the prophet or the president of the mormon church mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty big deal and something that i'm pretty yeah. sure the mormon church didn't want anybody to know yep. um Here's the thing that he kept finding, though. He kept finding documents that messed with the Mormon church's origin stories. So it wasn't that he was finding, like, ooh, positive, wonderful stuff. No, it was stuff that was like, oh, crap, that's not the story we've been telling all this time. Like, it was starting to make people question the origin of the Mormon church because of the documents he was finding. Like the Joseph Smith III blessing. Yeah. which was a document that supposedly gave evidence that Joseph Smith had said that his son, Joseph Smith III, should be his successor as the second prophet of the Mormon church, rather yeah. than Brigham Young, who was known to be the okay. successor of Joseph Smith. And so it kind of made people question a little bit, and people were a little uncomfortable about this, because this yeah. changed the history of the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, the plan here was make these documents, get the Mormon church to buy them, basically to bury them because they were messing with their, um, with their narrative mm -hmm. and, you know, make lots of money. That was basically <laughs> the plan. That was it. But yeah. The church so, would either buy them themselves or wealthy Mormons would buy them and donate yeah. them to the church. And most yeah. of them, not all, but a lot of them were, were things that were just purchased to be quietly put away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, here we are with some stuff that messes with the uh, narrative, although none of it was true anyway. Yeah. So right. one interesting. Right. Yeah. So 
you know, we've got this going back and forth. He even gets the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is called the RLDS, which That's is the kind polygamous of like, leg. <laughs> yeah. Um, in on this because they're like, fine, if you Mormons don't want it, I'll get you Mormons to buy it. You know, and he's kind of like getting a bidding war going on some of this stuff. So mm -hmm. then in 1984, his most famous forgery for the Mormon church. And don't mm -hmm. think these are his only for forgeries because they're not. He has no. lots of historical stuff. But this is the stuff oh, yeah. that results in him being in prison for life. Yeah. So he um, says that he has found something called the salamander letter. Yes. And the salamander letter. Okay, so... The, the or, some of the origin story of the Mormon church is that Joseph Smith has a vision from the angel Moroni who tells him where to dig in the hill Camorra to get the golden plates. And the golden plates are what he translates to become the Book of Mormon. Am I getting this right? Basically. Yeah, I, roughly. Yeah. Roughly. Okay. So then out comes the salamander letter. This is in 1984. So the salamander letter says that it wasn't the angel Moroni, but it was a white salamander that led Joseph Smith to find the golden plates. Mm -hmm. Well, this throws a real wrench in the whole situation because, you know, the whole thing about the visitations from Major Moroni are a huge part of the origins of Mormonism. And people are like, whoa, like what kind of weird, like it was okay if an angel came and led you there, but a white salamander? That sounds like magic, basically, is what happened. That's kind of how it came out. Yeah. Um, even, and so the, the letter was authenticated, of course, because, you know, all his stuff was. So the Mormon church did buy the salamander letter. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of came out with this sort of explaining thing about how it still meant the same thing. That the word salamander could refer to a mythical being that was able to live in fire. And that being that was able to live in fire is a good approximation of the description Joseph Smith gave of the angel Moroni. So they actually change their own history change right. their own story well they they to match put the a letter. spin on it yeah yeah they, they put a spin on it to try to make that uh you know they did some real mental gymnastics there to uh yeah. find a way in an interview he said he chose a white salamander to spice things up a little he did yeah it was <laughs> gonna be a toad or something and then he a thought toad, yeah white salamander sounds a lot more magic-y i guess <laughs> So yeah, this was a like, big deal. I, I mean, yeah, I remember stories about the white salamander. This was 1984, so I was nine. So that made you seven-ish. Mm -hmm. I remember white salamander. I remember stories about that. I sort mm -hmm. of, I don't think I fully grasped it or understood what it meant. But being a Mormon kid in the 80s, this was a big deal because this was kind of like people it was getting this stuff was getting out into the news sometimes because the mormon church released it sometimes mm -hmm. because hoffman did himself mm -hmm. to screw with them because really this all was about revenge i guess against the mormon church yeah um yeah i have a theory on that but okay we'll hear that yeah but i do i do kind of remember this white salamander thing or something mm -hmm. about it so there were a bunch of other Mormon forgeries, but the one that gets real important mm -hmm. is the McClellan collection. Yeah. So, you know, this may come as no surprise, but Hoffman was not good with money. And he, not only was he making lots of money, he was driving this fancy Toyota sports car. Mm -hmm. um, in the documentary, it's a very 80s car, like with the pop-up headlights and all mm -hmm. that, you know, the, all that stuff. Anyway, um, he was spending a lot of money and he was struggling to pay his debts because he also was buying all kinds of actual real legal documents. And he, yeah. in his selling of the forgeries, he was also selling real documents and real books and stuff yeah. so that it didn't seem like it was all just forgeries. Although mm -hmm. I got to tell you, 
absolutely no one suspected him. No one. No. But he was kind of mixing it up to try to make sure oh. that nobody caught him. So he comes up with that he's got access to something called the McClellan Collection, yeah. which is supposedly a group of documents that was written by William E. McClellan. He was an early Mormon apostle. Apostles are part of the leadership of the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. um, he eventually left the LDS church and that there was supposedly some stuff in here that was kind of unfavorable to the LDS church. So mm -hmm. do you see where we're going with this? Like it was yeah. always about stuff that was going to be unfavorable, change their history, mm -hmm. make them look like they weren't telling the truth, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So he's trying to broker this deal to sell the McClellan collection, except that he didn't actually know where it was. And he also didn't have any time to forge it. Like he kind of put himself on this trajectory of mm -hmm. something's going to happen because he can't come up with it. Yeah. He was also kind of in trouble because he had come up with the original copy of the oath of a free man or freeman, mm -hmm. which was thought to be the very first printed document in the U S mm -hmm. And although the, the poem on it is well known, no one had ever come across the original piece of paper, right? So he, you know, forged one and was going to sell it for what, like $1.2 million or something. It was a lot. But that was kind of being held up because there were questions about its authenticity. For the first time, somebody was like, eh, I'm not sure if this is real or not. Yeah. So... Well he tells the authenticator that if he can authenticate it, he'll split it, the uh, cells from it oh, with yeah. half, which they were trying, hoping to sell it for like a million dollars or some crazy thing. Yeah. But yeah. So he actually gives the which, authenticator a real, uh, you know, incentive because he's willing to split his profit with him. Right. But it's yeah. also, that's totally illegal. Yeah. And um, is a pretty good indication that it wasn't real. Yeah. So Mark fell back on the only skill that he had besides being a forger, which was building bombs. And this is where we really find out what kind of a sociopath Mark Hoffman was, is. Yeah. So he knew how to build pipe bombs because he and his friends used to build them when they were kids and blow them up, as you do. That part yeah. blew me away. Like, seriously? Yeah. So. <laughs> Only him. So crazy. <laughs> Only him. So on October yeah. 15th of 1985, he kills a document collector named Stephen Christensen. Stephen Christensen worked for the Mormon church. He was a very well-known and beloved document um authenticator and he was the guy that was supposed to be receiving the McClellan collection from him that day. Mm -hmm. He had an appointment with him that day along with some of the general authorities of the Mormon church to see about buying this McClellan collection, which he didn't have. He had in his car some journals and some old forged stuff he had kind of put together, but he knew he didn't have enough. So... He delivered yeah. a bomb, a pipe bomb to Stephen, to Steve Christensen's office. Yep. And when he opened the box, it blew up and killed him. Mm -hmm. ab it was absolutely horrifying what happened to him. It also, yeah, it also injured a secretary who took right. uh, some shrapnel to the leg. He wrapped that bomb in nails. Oh. Yeah. So that there would be, you know, plenty of shrapnel to be sure that whoever opened it was definitely going to die. Yeah. yeah. And this was inside an office building. Like, I mean, yeah. how did he know that it wouldn't, like, take down the whole building or kill way more people? I don't and, think he And the cared. truth is, he didn't care. He didn't no. care at all. So he kills Stephen Christensen basically to buy some time mm -hmm. for what? I don't know. So then... He delivers a bomb to the Sheets resident. And the bomb is supposed to be for Mr. Sheets. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. who Gary Sheets, who was um, Stephen Christensen's former employer. So he was kind of trying to make it look like they were connected in some way, like to throw off the scent from him, even though no one was looking for him. This is the part that's so crazy and paranoid is that yeah. no one, he hadn't presented the McClellan collection. If he backed out, nothing would have happened to him at all. But he got well, this Well, except for that he head. had borrowed a lot of money from someone to purchase oh, yeah. the McClellan I mean, collection. But yeah. Right. I mean, he was in huge trouble. But as far as like legal trouble, right. He wasn't in legal trouble. Nobody no. still, nobody had actually pegged him as a forger yet. No. But this is where his mental health really, I think, went, took a deep dive. So yeah. he delivers the second bomb to Gary Sheets' house. Unfortunately, it's his wife, Kathy Sheets, who opens the bomb. The bomb explodes and kills her, as you can imagine. So yeah. initially they, you know, suspect this has to do with something to do with Gary Sheets' business or Stephen Christensen's work or whatever. Mm-hmm. So then he finds out that somebody saw him deliver the bomb to Steve Christensen's office. They identify yeah. the green letterman jacket that he was wearing. And he knows that people who know him are going to figure that out. So he decides the only thing left to do is kill himself with a bomb. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. So the next day, he blows up another bomb with himself inside his car. And it, for a while, makes him look like he is the third victim of these bombings. But here's the thing. He didn't die. No. He was hurt. But he didn't yeah, but die. Not that hurt. Yeah. Not that hurt. I go, I don't think he wrapped uh, his pipe bomb in nails. I gotta right. say, I don't think you know, his other bombs were meant to be very lethal. So he lives through yeah. all of this. So yeah. eventually, one of his dear friends, who was just heartbroken by this, recognizes the description of the Letterman jacket and has to call the police and say, "I think that might be Mark Kaufman's jacket." So in the meantime, all these other document dealers that he works with, they're all scared to death. They're like going underground because they think they're next. Well, the FBI told, tells them they might be, they could be at risk. They need to lay low. Yeah. Everyone's scared to death. The whole city is super shaken up over it. Everybody is very afraid. Yeah. Yeah, It's awful. It was a horrible, terrifying thing. So then his friend hears the description of the jacket and is like, huh. That's Mark's jacket. So he tells the police. Mm -hmm. So the police go to his house with a search warrant. And what do they find? Well, you know what they find. They find a whole workshop of forgery stuff in that locked room. They even find laying in a hospital bed. So he can't, he wasn't able to clear out that room or do anything to, yeah, because he, you know, made the decision he did. Yeah. Yeah. So they even find the engraving plate that he had made to forge the oath of a freeman, you know. Yeah. So they immediately know that's forged. Mm-hmm. Then there's then they're unsure of what else is forged and what isn't. And they go through this whole process in which a bunch of stuff gets authenticated by the FBI that is actually fake. And they figure out who Mark Hoffman is, and the people around him are completely floored. Absolutely no one flabbergasted. Yeah. Yeah. No one suspects him. Again, he's a good Mormon guy, you know. He wouldn't mm-hmm. do such things. His friends are absolutely stunned. In the documentary, when they hear his confession, because his confession is chilling. And if I could play it for you, I would, but um apparently they're not. The Netflix documentary people are a lot better than me because I can't find a recording of it that I could get access to. So he, when they're listening to him confess, they all cry. These are men in their like Mm -hmm. 60s and they're all crying. Mm -hmm. They cannot believe that this guy who they thought was their good friend is this murderer and document forger and Mm -hmm. is a sociopath. And he doesn't. Complete indifference. Total indifference. Yeah does not care at all that he has murdered people, that he's done all this terrible stuff. 
So he was arrested in January of 1986 and originally indicted on four indictments that were 27 different counts, including first degree murder for delivering the bomb. And then there was all the theft and the fraud and all, I mean, all this stuff. So then, of course, the Mormon church is like, oh, shit, you know, they send a bunch of their documents, including the salamander letter off to the FBI to have them authenticated. Mm -hmm. And the FBI says they're real. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is going on? You know, <laughs> this part killed me. I was like, All right. so they do eventually get proof because they discover that all of the ink that he is using is doing this weird alligator skin looking crackling under a microscope and every single document that he has sold looks like that and that's really yeah. how they prove that oh this, these are forgeries but <laughs> can mm -hmm. you imagine sending stuff off to the fbi because you're not sure and you get back an authentication mm -hmm. on stuff that oh, by the way very fake but that's how good this guy was mm -hmm. He was he amazing. He had developed all of these techniques. Like he would yeah. create a document and put it on a screen with some a tiny bit of suction. Like on a, he, he had a fish aquarium set up with a screen yeah. on the lid and some suction. So he'd put a document on it that he had stamped or printed. And then he would create just enough suction to pull the uh, ink through the paper just enough because... Back in the day, that ink was acidic and it would actually eat through the paper just yeah. barely. And so he had worked out a system to make it look just like that. He yeah. used hydrogen peroxide. He used, you know, all kinds of things. That created he ozone yes, in that created fish ozone. aquarium mm -hmm. to make the um, the to make the paper age. Like he, age, yeah, you know, he was brilliant in this. It just, you know, sadly was a criminal enterprise. Yeah. Well, in the one document, he stuffed inside a very old Bible and found it right in front of his wife. Yeah. No, let her find it. That's she right. found it and yeah. showed it to him. To him. Yep. And he apparently once tested her to see how she would feel if he was the one making these documents. And it might have been that one or it was another really famous document that he was showing her. And she's like, I can't believe you found this. This is so amazing. And he said, well, I made it. I made that document. And she was immediately like incensed. Like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, no, I'm just kidding. It's real. And was like, that was the one time that he uh -huh. tested her to see is she going to be okay with this or not? Turns out, no. Okay, I won't tell her that. Yeah. I'll just keep the door locked. She'll never know, which mm -hmm. clearly worked like a charm. It did. But, you know, the in his uh, as he's going through the process of going to trial, she's standing by her man at, at first. At first. And there's a portion of the interview process where they ask him about her involvement. And he says she has none. She had no idea and tells that mm -hmm. story. And, and then he... Uh, they say as she, uh, you know, asks him something about it. Will she divorce you now? Like, you know, what do you think will happen there? Oh no, no, no. You know, he was quite sure that she would just stand by him. He was, yeah, yeah. he was. So, so eventually he pleads guilty. Yeah, to all of it, and he says that he will confess his forgeries in open court. Um, in in return for you know dropping some charges. He really bizarrely is sentenced to five years to life. Yeah. That is the broadest range of a sentence right? I've ever heard. And a lot of people really have been very uncomfortable with the way that this case was handled by the judge and the prosecution, yeah. that he committed two first degree murders. Plus yeah. he, you know, he endangered who knows how many people with those freaking oh, yeah. bombs, let alone all the forgeries and stuff. I mean, the human life part of it, there had been mm -hmm. questions that there had been some kind of intervention. And it's not known if this is true or not, but there have been rumors that there was some sort of intervention on the part of the Mormon church to just hurry up and, you know, get him a deal and get him the hell out of here so that nobody mm -hmm. has to hear about this anymore. Because it was yeah. definitely an, an embarrassment for him. Yeah. So he agrees, you know, he's going to confess his forgeries in open court. And in 1980, 
88. So he's in jail for all of this for five to seven years because he pled guilty in 1987, yeah. January of 1987. In 1988, um, the Utah Board of Pardons wanted to hear from him. And he here's some of the things that he said, and this is why they have determined that he will never be released. They were asking, um, oh, he said when he thought about planting the bomb that killed Kathy Sheets, he said it was almost a game. At the time I made the bomb, my thoughts were that it didn't matter if it was Mrs. Sheets, a child, the dog, whoever was killed. Within the hour after that, the parole board decided uh, he has real yeah. callous disregard for human life and he mm -hmm. will spend the rest of his life in prison. Yep. And absolutely no remorse. So, yeah. yeah. So, Something thank God else, they did. I mean, what the hell? Right? Yeah. And, and five to life? What? Something else that he said to one of the investigators. I don't, in, in talking about the murder victims, he said, mm -hmm. I don't feel anything for them. My philosophy is that they're dead. They're not suffering. I think life yeah. is basically worthless. They could have died just as easily in a car accident. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in an afterlife. They don't know they're dead. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Sociopath much? A little bit. So, you know, he really thinks that, like, things are going to be okay for him. They're really not. Yeah. He was excommunicated from the Mormon church, and that's when his wife filed for divorce. I mean, I'm like, weird. Seriously. <laughs> That's what it took. Yeah. You know, all the murders wasn't enough. Yeah. So here is irony at its very best. So when he finds out that his wife is filing for divorce, he saves up a bunch of his medication. I, I've heard it's antidepressants. I've heard of sleeping pills. I'm not sure which it is. So he takes them all, trying to kill himself in prison. He doesn't die because apparently this dude is bulletproof and can't die because how many times is he going to survive something like this? Right. But here's what happened. He spent 12 hours laying on his right arm. So his right arm was under his body the whole time that he was knocked out from the meds. And it cut off the circulation to his right arm, causing major muscle atrophy. And he is now permanently disabled in his right arm yeah. and will never be able to forge anything ever again. Yep. And one more time, he did it to himself. Yep. Really muffed up the old forging hand. Yep. He really did. I don't know. You know, there's just some stuff that I'm like, can this get any weirder? Yeah. Well, so I, I want to tell you a little bit about Dory. Please do. After she leaves him. Yes. Okay. I had been wanting to learn about this because I knew there's something okay. here. After she leaves him, two years after she uh, divorces him, she goes on to co-create or co-develop uh, a holistic health company. And mm. she, so this was a really hard time for her, obviously. She was shunned by her imagine. community and her family. Uh, like it was really, really hard. After she divorced him and went back to her maiden name, she, her family eventually kind of pulled her back in. So did the church. She finally felt like she had something going for herself. She went through some real depression, suicidal stuff. It was really hard on her. I cannot imagine. Can imagine. It's yeah. Awful. So she decided that she needed to learn how to love and accept herself. And so she started using hypnosis, Reiki, light and sound waves, and life coaching techniques to help herself heal and then to start helping her clients heal from their traumas and to... Uh, you know, accomplish their goals. So eventually she wrote a book called Dory's Story, The Hoffman Bombings. Oh, and so wow. she even now, she's a creation coach at the School of Creation. She's a board certified uh, consulting hypnotist, a Reiki master instructor. She practices lymphatic massage and continues to work in holistic health. Which I just think is kind of the sweetest thing that that's where her life spun off to is to a Good place of you, helping Dory. and healing. Yeah, isn't that cool? I think that's wonderful. And I'm glad she finally had a life where she got to choose herself. Because yeah. when you're married to some jackass that won't even, that locks you out of a room in your own damn house, obviously not the best situation. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Well, that's and great. Yeah, and she's, you know, developed a life in which she can help other people heal from their trauma as well, since she certainly knows trauma. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I want to tell you, we, we have to talk about 
the Shannon Flynn Mark Hoffman relationship. But before we get there, I have to tell you just kind of some funny after the fact things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Hoffman once paid $22,500 for the first edition of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Jealous. I'm a huge yeah. fan, but $22,500. Mm -hmm. No wonder he was out of money. Yeah. So here's another funny part. Um, turns out those McClellan papers that he was faking, mm -hmm. yeah, they exist. And oh, yeah, they right do. after the bombings, somebody found them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there are actually two different sets mm -hmm. of journals, documents from McClellan, and they do some pretty nasty stuff about Mormon Church. Yeah. But I did find it pretty funny that they do exist and someone did find them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he was really starting to break down there at the end. And in, in the Oath of the Freeman, he made a couple of pretty obvious errors in the poem that made it quite clear that the document that he created could not possibly have been the original because uh, they had typos. <laughs> Sorry. I just think that's funny as hell. That's pretty it, great, actually. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, You know, just interesting stuff. You know, obviously, um, after this happened, the LDS church really changed the way that they were handling their archives and um, document acquisition and stuff because they realized that ah, maybe they, you know, ought to step it up a bit because they'd gotten taken so bad. Mm -hmm. Like I read at one in one place that the Mormon church bought 41 documents from him. So there's tons yeah. of stuff out there that we don't even know that never went public yeah. that they bought from him the fake, which mm -hmm. I found rather interesting. Not to mention private members who, you know, bought things from him as well. And and just yes. private collectors of Americana, because it wasn't just LDS people that he was forging. It was all yeah. kinds of uh, American figures, you know. And so there, there was, it's a deep well, a very deep well. It is a deep well. I thought this was a very interesting quote. So Charles Hamilton, who is, he's a New York document dealer and he's, thought to be probably the nation's preeminent detector of forged documents said mm -hmm. Mark Hoffman was unquestionably the most skilled forger this country has ever seen. Mm -hmm. He said he fooled me. He fooled everybody. Yep. Crazy. Yep. That this wackadoodle bomber was this good mm -hmm. at what he did. Isn't that yeah. wild? He was excellent. And had he not gotten crazy and hadn't gotten so greedy and had managed his money better, he might have pulled this off forever. Right. One thing that he did that really blew people's minds is that he created documents that he managed to get authenticated, and then he would create more documents that the forgery was used against was, to authenticate that one. So the forgeries right. were authenticating more forgeries. He was creating exactly. this body of this web of work. Yeah, yeah, that once the original doc, the first document was authenticated, then everything after it would be based on that document. So, yeah. So, well, here's the paper some stuff. And the ink and the writing style and things would be the same because he did it all. Right. Yeah. Because he, yeah, so crazy. So, besides, of course, the Mormon stuff we've talked about, some other things that he forged, he's forged a lot of signatures. He was mm -hmm. super good at copying people's handwriting and signatures. He forged signatures of George Washington, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Daniel Boone, John Brown, Andrew Jackson, Mark Twain, Mark Twain, Nathan Hale, John Hancock, Francis Scott Key, Abraham Lincoln, John Milton, Paul Revere, Miles Standish, and Button Gwinnett. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so Button Gwinnett, this was a very rare signature and the most valuable signature of anyone who signed the Declaration of Independence because Button's uh, signature was very hard to find. So, of course, Hoffman did it because he'd make more money that way. Of course he did. Yeah. He also uh, forged a previously unknown poem in the hand of Emily Dickinson. Yeah. So he wrote the freaking <laughs> poem. He didn't just forge it. He wrote the poem to match her. Like, 
what? This is so weird. It's just That's so like the white weird. salamander letter. I mean, yeah, yeah, not cooking only up the did whole he, thing. Yeah. yeah, not only did he write, you know, do the forgery, but he also made up the text and and made it sound correct for the time. And like people dude, believe that was a lost Emily Dickinson. Crazy. Okay, so we've given you a lot of information about Hoffman, and of course, you can watch. Murder Among the Mormons to get more because there's lots more. Mm -hmm. But we have to talk, and I'm going to put their pictures up here about Shannon Flynn and Mark Hoffman. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of Mark Hoffman in prison because mm -hmm. that's the only picture I really want to show of his face because mm -hmm. he's an asshole. That's the most this current. Is, like That's like 2017. Yeah, that's quite current. Um, yeah. This other guy is Shannon Flynn who is cute as hell. Mm -hmm. um in the uh in the documentary but he and mark hoffman were what you might call best friends they were, were the kind of friends what? they were thicker than thieves they were they were the kind of best friends who were straight male mormons who traveled a lot together and stayed mm -hmm. in the same hotel room if that tells you anything mm -hmm. There I, is a picture of them in the documentary, and we were unable to get a hold of it. Netflix was that documentaries. Good. Yeah, yeah. And they it looks like it looks like engagement pictures I've seen. You know, it, I mean it totally it's does. It's not yeah. two friends standing together. It looks like lovers standing together. It definitely so does. So since this came out, lots and lots of people have asked the question, were these two more than friends? Yeah. It's my takeaway that they were. That's it mine too. Yeah. Well, when you hear Shannon Flynn speak about Mark Hoffman, even now, because he has, you know, come to terms with what Mark Hoffman has done. Yeah. But even now, he speaks of him like it's absolute hero worship, man. Yeah. He was hook, line, and sinker, head over heels for Hoffman. Mm -hmm. Now, did Hoffman use Shannon Flynn? For information oh. and to help authenticate documents and stuff Actual like that. Actual expertise, yes. Hell to the yes, he did. Oh yeah, and he fooled Shannon completely. Mm -hmm. And it's it's sad. I think mm -hmm. it's sad because I think this whole thing was uh, in the midst of all of this terrible stuff that happened. Shannon Flynn got his heart broken in a big oh, way. Oh, totally, totally. That so even now clear. he chokes up talking about it. Oh, he can hardly talk about it. Yeah, he already has this really raspy, funky voice that kind of makes you wonder if he's mm -hmm. been through a, a medical event in his throat of some sort. But he trying sounds, to, yeah. yeah. Well, he sounds like so. I had my thyroid out six years ago because I had a tumor, and that tumor was pressing on my vocal folds. Mm -hmm. And so I sound I could barely make a sound that was more than a whisper for like six months after that. He sounds like that to me. Yeah. So something's yeah. happened to his voice box because when they show a uh, film of him earlier, he doesn't sound like that at all. No, this is as of late for sure. At the very end, they ask him a question about. Yeah. Flynn and he, or about Hoffman and he says can I ask you a favor can you please not make me answer that I mean it was a Broadway performance I'll give you that but oh, it was <laughs> you know, I mean the outfit very dramatic it, the, the whole thing the dude is a pro uh -huh. I mean but at the he end could... he says yeah he was fantastic yep and he means yeah. that he, he still means that with yeah. his whole heart yeah. He's one of the only people that still visit Hoffman occasionally, which I think is sad. I just, I, my heart well, He's also one anything. of the only people that's allowed to visit Hoffman. Yes, that's true. And when he did Dory, write a book about this experience. Yep. When Dory filed for divorce, Hoffman banned her from visiting. Yeah. She's never been back to see him she's, because she's not yeah, allowed. They have to be. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. I just, my heart really broke for Shannon Flynn. I really did. I oh, could tell that there was way more to this story for him mm -hmm. at one point when he was being asked, like, how could you not know? He said, I didn't want to know. Yeah. Just like Dory didn't want to know. They saw this sort of superhero in Mark Hoffman. I think that they just mm -hmm. couldn't admit to themselves that maybe this wasn't really the case. Well, and for Shannon Flynn, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I'm guessing that Shannon Flynn was not popular 
Yeah. I'm guessing that when he was in high school, he was probably a weirdo that didn't mm-hmm. fit in. Yeah. And in college, he was probably a weirdo that didn't fit in. He had a hard time attracting friends. He was just kind of a quirky, weird guy. Super nice yeah. guy. I'm not trying to drag him, but you know, I'm guessing no, but... he didn't fit in well in most circles. And yeah. suddenly he meets this rock star documents guy that not only, uh, you know, is he showing interest in him as a person, he becomes his friend. And I yeah. think it just meant more to him to be in that in circle than it probably did to anybody else. But Absolutely. it also meant that he got taken advantage of right and left. He did. He did. Yeah. Very interesting, but kind of a sad side story here is that was there yeah. a relationship between these two men and, and was it really reciprocated or was this another part of Mark Hoffman's game? You know, one of the people in the um, documentary who knew him said, the Mark Hoffman I knew could never have done this. But it turns out I didn't know Mark Hoffman. Yeah. Because he played a really good character yeah. that hey, clearly isn't knew Mark Hoffman. Right. Right. But Shannon tells a story about them being in New York at some mm-hmm. kind of, you know, doing document stuff and have yeah. dinner with some people. And Mark drinks a ton and Mormons yeah. don't drink at no. all. That yes. is totally, and he kind of gives him sort of a when in Rome kind of speech. Yeah. And drinks. And even in the documentary, Shannon makes sure to say, I did not drink. It wasn't me. I didn't drink. <laughs> it was but Mark, Mark drank a ton. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was, you know, he, he, the whole, all of that really well, kind of made me go, yeah. He pretended not to be drunk. And then they got, this is when you yeah. find out they're in the same hotel room because Shannon says, when we got back to our room, he ran in the bathroom and puked himself green. <laughs> it's because he was faking it the whole time. Because he we was just drinking like, on. yeah, and like just straight up, like okay, hard liquor. He was drinking like people who don't know how to drink. So yeah, yeah. When people like adults leave the LDS church, yes, it's very common for them to get into trouble with alcohol pretty quick because they don't know how to drink. Right. And they don't understand that drinking, it's this isn't drinking, you know, 16 ounces of, you know, soda. I, you know, and it, it, that part just made me laugh because I thought oh, he didn't know how to drink. He was showing off yeah. for those people. He didn't yeah. actually know how he could have had, you know, a scotch on the rocks or, you know, a, a Jack and Coke or something very, uh, you know, simple that he didn't get drunk. That he didn't have a lot of alcohol, but he didn't. He went balls to the wall. And yeah, yeah. I was, I think that just reminds me of so many people when they, uh, I don't know, you know, when they get off the, uh, the chain and decide that they're going to drink, they make themselves <laughs> as hell. Cause they don't know what they're doing. It is a huge mistake. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we've seen that many times. Yeah, yeah. It's so true. Well, I wanted to share with you some snippets from his confession because yeah. this is pretty chilling stuff. So he said, As far back as I can remember, I have liked to impress people through my deceptions. Fooling people gave me a sense of power and superiority. I believe this is what led to my forging activities. So this wasn't just about money. This was getting it over on people. Oh, yeah. When he was afraid he was going to be caught for the bombings, he said, the most important thing in my mind was to keep from being exposed as a fraud in front of my family and friends. When I say this was the most important thing, I mean it literally. I felt I would rather take human life or even my own life rather than be exposed. Yep. That's pretty damn extreme. Uh, He says, talking about his forgeries, I figured out some crude ways to fool other collectors by altering coins to make them more desirable. At the time I was 14, I had developed a forgery technique, which I felt was unacceptable. And he loved, um, you know, taking those into collectors and, and, you know, lording it over them. About the homicides, he said, my motives and feelings which led to the murders are hard for even me to understand, much less explain. And he said, this is weird because it's weird because of what Dory is doing now. He said, uh, when he is writing about his life of crime, he learned to live with the inherent stress, guilt, and fears through rationalization and hypnosis. Oh, interesting. 
That is interesting. Right? Hmm. Yeah. When talking about the bombings, he said, at the time, I was not even sure who the victims would be, only that drastic measures were called for. My original intention was suicide with another killing or killings as a diversion. Wow. Just crazy. Yeah. yeah. Definitely that desire to be admired was so big in him that he went to this place. Yes. There is a part of me that there it there's a spot in the documentary where someone says Mark's dad was really really strict when he was oh, a yeah. kid. And, Super. Yeah, and he he had a pretty you know rough relationship with his parents. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things about that that I think are interesting. I mean, first of all, you know, he serves a mission for a church that he has no belief in, which is pretty interesting. Uh, then he starts forging stuff that humiliates that church, which again, I go, there's a lot of resentment there. There's a, a lot, lot of resentment towards yeah. the church. He's humiliating the church on purpose because he's been humiliated by the church. Yeah. But the other piece of that for me was actually him getting some uh, recognition and approval from his dad. Yeah. When his dad had cancer and was super sick and they didn't even know if he would live. Guess who produces a really rare document to make his dad's day, you know, yeah. and his, they were all so proud of him. And it was so heartfelt for his dad who was so ill and yeah, really interesting. All of the pieces of this wrapped into, uh, you know, the, the, the bundle that is Mark Hoffman, but yeah, absolutely. interesting. Really, really interesting. You know, he would not speak to the um, to the people producing the documentary. Yeah, he's not in it. Other than you know, just like that's news and he's not in it. That's interesting. He was pretty, uh, pretty to, you know, pretty interested in letting everyone know what he did at the time, but he's not quite as brazen now. I think. Yeah. No. I would imagine that his mental health has taken quite the hit in prison. Uh, I would imagine so. He was well, pretty used to getting away with anything. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, a little more entertaining takeaways. <laughs> yeah. Because this was a film about the 80s. There was some church uh, mm -hmm. paraphernalia type, uh, you know, like church film stuff in the very beginning. The hymn and the... Uh, people going to church and stuff that looked so classic of things that we saw as kids. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Could have just there been was... our ward and our dresses. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. There was a scene where Dory was vacuuming a room and it was red shag carpet. And that was hilarious to me. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, we've seen that. Well, early on in the film, and I don't remember who said it, but there was a man that said something about, well, he said, I don't give a care, which is a Mormon's way of saying, I don't <laughs> give a damn. Yeah. And I just busted out laughing when I heard that because I haven't heard that phrase yeah. in so long. But Mormons were oh, that very was... hard at not cussing. And so they have a lot mm -hmm. of alternatives. And I don't give a care was one we said all the time as kids. Oh, yeah. With with feeling, man. Oh, that, yeah. that was very... Uh, Napoleon Dynamite-esque to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very, very much so. And that the director of this film is the same director as yeah. Napoleon Dynamite. But mm -hmm. it was so funny. I don't give a care. I hadn't said that. You know, I just say all the bad words now, but I didn't as a kid. No. <laughs> Are you kidding we me? We did see some, some drinking of Tab in the film, which was hilarious because yes. our parents were big fans of Tab. Well, it was Ugh. after the bombing, the bombing yeah. of the office building when they showed the... Uh, the footage of it, there's cans of tab all over the place. Yeah, that yeah. killed me. Yeah, that was very, very 80s Mormon stuff. Mm -hmm. Very true to the times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much. Well, this is our presentation of Mark Hoffman, who was very obviously a Mormon murderer as well mm -hmm. as a Mormon document forger and honestly a tremendously brilliant 
and misguided person, unfortunately. I, but we felt like it would it? be interesting to share our take on this, considering where we live and our backgrounds, and mm -hmm. because it's a dang interesting story and a sad one. Yeah, it is. And for the loss, one, for, sure. for the losses of the families, the Sheets family and the Christensen family. I, I, I imagine they still feel well, it every day. The Hoffman family. Yes. His yes, wife and, and his Hoffman four family. kids who have had to live with the yeah. fact that this is who their dad is. Yeah. Luckily, I'm. it's obvious they've got a great mom who I'm thinking Man, probably she helped really them heal stepped up. and move forward. Yeah. Yep. Yep. She has. That is true. Well, I guess nothing like your husband being a murderer to uh, make you have to step up and get something figured out, you know? Yeah, well, she clearly did. I, think I would imagine cool. she lost everything, you know? Oh, I'm sure she did. He was already in enormous debt, and yeah. I would imagine she lost everything by the time this oh, was yeah. done. I'll bet she did. Hmm. Well, guys, that is our presentation on Mark Hoffman. You know it. We are True Crime Paranormal. This is our Tuesday show. We will be back on Wednesday with our MMIW case for the week and Wednesday night for some case updates and at 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time on our YouTube channel as a live stream. And we'll be back Thursday night with a live stream at 7 p.m. Pacific, which is the Psychic Hour. So yep. you, you know who we are and what we do. We always like to remind you. So thanks for joining us tonight, you guys. Take care.